Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. I said, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Amen. Can we all stand in the house this morning? Psalms 96 says, singing to the Lord a new song. Is there anybody that's got a new song in their life? It's been resurrected from what was dead and now is alive. Is there anybody got a testimony? Can we worship the Lord? Come on, can we worship Him? He's worthy. He's worthy. Let's give Him a hand clap of praise and enter into His gates with thanksgiving in our heart.
Come on, church. If your name's been written in glory, let's praise the Lord with all of our might today. Let's get into his presence. Let's thank him for everything that he's done for us. We have to be thankful today. We get to come into the presence of the almighty God. You can be changed in this church service. Let's get together, one accord and one mind. Let's all be filled with the Spirit today. If you haven't been filled, you can come to this altar and you can lay it all out for Him and you can receive what He has for you. Today is the day you can be changed. Why leave here in the same mess you came in with? Let's be changed today. Let's get something new. My Lord, the presence of the Lord is in here today and there's a reason for it. He's wanting to change somebody today. Man. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I know today, like right now, we're supposed to be going into the offering. But I'm just so thankful. I'm thankful he allows me to come into this place and be connected with you folks. I'm so thankful. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. If Heidi could get the ways to give up on the board. We got GiveLify. We got PayPal at RiverbendPentecostals.com. You can send cash and checks. Be mailed to Riverbend and Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. Text to give is 833- 8839311 This prayer works. This prayer if you have faith it'll work in your life. It's worked in mine and I know this worked in many people. So if you have faith today let's let's say it with faith. Let's believe in it. Upon the authority of your word I have given and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together and running over. I am a tither and I give my offerings. And I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off. Yes, demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I am blessed going out in all that I do in Jesus' name. Amen. Come give. Thank you.
Just lift our hands in the house this morning. Just lift our hands for a moment and thank Him. Praise Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There's a sweet spirit of the Lord in the house this morning. Come on, everybody, just raise your hands for a moment. Open your mouth for a moment and acknowledge Him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You're the reason we're here, Lord. We magnify you, God. We remember where you brought us from. I remember, God, where you've led me from and where I am today. Unworthy, oh God, of your spirit, but so thankful. So thankful, oh God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What a mighty God we serve. You may be seated in the house this morning. I'm so thankful for what I feel in this place right now. I don't know about the rest of you, but my dad was a military man, Brother David. And so growing up, he had some mementos hanging in the closet. And as a young boy, I used to sneak in there and I'd put his Army stuff on or his Air Force stuff, rather, and I'd put them on and I'd grab a helmet that my cousin gave me an old BB gun that I had, Brother Skipper, and I'd sneak off in the backyard. It was all growed up past the fence. And me and my little brother, we'd crawl around in there, and we was Army guys, Navy SEALs, the baddest of the bad. Had little forts built. Had places of, of shelter built so the enemy couldn't see us. And as an older man, I find myself sometimes watching the military channel, Brother Bucky. And I watched a group of guys during what is known as Hell Week. How many of y'all have ever been through a week like that in your life? And these guys, Brother Robbie, there's many of them started out. One by one, the old bell would ring and they'd give up. But there came a point in the middle of all the training, Brother Bucky, that the bell quit ringing. And the men began to look at those that were left. And they said, we realize they've got something different than the rest of the class. Something in these guys is different. Because there were some of them with broke legs, literally, that were still pressing on. There was others with toes all taped up that they'd get duct tape and just tape themselves up and go. And the guys that were leading it, the sergeants and all of that of the platoon said, we realized that we had to watch them more carefully because they didn't have any quit left in them. And they would literally go till they fell over dead. And I began to realize, as I was reading here not too long ago, a man by the name of Brother Tenney, he wrote, God is more concerned with our development than he is our comfort. Now think about that for a minute. God is more concerned with our development, then he is our comfort. Hell week was tough. There was no sleep. There was nothing to eat. But it was developing them to be the greatest fighting force that the world has ever seen. We sit there and we gripe, Sister Meredith. We fuss about things in our life. We don't understand why we're going through hell on earth. We don't understand why everything looks like it's falling apart. But God said, if you just give me a moment, I am developing you in 
into something that you're going to be for my kingdom. It's not about your wants. It's not about your cares. It's not about the comfort that you're missing. But it's something in you that I'm going to use you to reach this world that is broken, undone, and worried because they don't have a a place to go. They don't know what way to go. But we're going to lead them. We're going to direct them because God is changing us to be the light in a dark place. Amen. He's changing us to be what he needs us to be in this world. God is about to turn some things around in this place this morning if we just allow him to. Amen. If everybody would, let's stand on our feet right now. If you've got any worries, if you've got any fears, if there's things you've been battling, if there's hell been going on in your life, I want you to come to the front of this place right now this morning. If you're sick, if you're worried, if there's something wrong with it that you don't know what it is, come on up because the waters are troubled in this place. If you want something to happen in your life, if you want some things to happen in your life, if you're tired of fighting the fight you've always fought, Brother Robbie, this is the place. This is the rest wherein we cause the weary to rest. And guess what? This is the refreshing, amen? And there's something going to begin to take place in this place. A turnaround, if you will, if you trust that God is able to do it. So I want everybody in this place to reach your hand this way. We're going to pray for these people right now. Raise your hands before the Lord. God, we stand before you in this place right now. God, we come broken. We come weary. Some come on top of the world, and some come in the lowest valley. But I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you're God no matter what place we come in. No matter what we come in, God, no matter the attitude, no matter the spirit, you're still the same. Your word says you change not. God, and I claim upon the authority of your word that you change the lives and the mindset of this people today. God, that you move upon every need, every situation, every circumstance, whatever the pain may be, whatever the sickness may be, whatever the hell may be in their life. God, I know you're able to deliver them because, Lord, you delivered me. And if you can deliver me, God, you can deliver anybody. And I'm a work in progress. And they're a work in progress. But we know, God, beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're going to turn it around for somebody in this place. Have your way, God. And we're going to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. Bless them, Lord, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. And the church said, Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. And thank him for what he's doing in the house this morning.
He is the one that can turn your life around today. He is the one that holds the keys. He's the one that can release you from the prison you've been in. He's the one that can break the chains that have you held down. He's the way maker. It's no secret that the Lord's already been working in this place this morning, Brother David. Let's just give him some more praise right now. It seems that it never fails to happen like this, but about 1230 this morning, my little pager went off and we got called out to a fire, Brother Ronnie. A few hours later, we're going to be putting out the fires of hell in the Riverbank Pentecostals. We're going to let... We're going to let the word go forth. We're going to be in here. We're going to preach truth. We're going to respond. We're going to see people's lives turned around at the Riverbend Pentecostals today because that's what we do. We give them the word and we let God do the work. We're going to see great things happen in this place today. I believe it. You all can go ahead and be seated if you would like. I'm going to try not to be long today. I've got a, I've got a word for somebody in this place. And I'm going to try not to draw it out. I'm going to try to be to the point, Brother Josh. If you've been alive for more than about 30 minutes in this world, you know that most people that you come across out in the world are quick to judge. They're quick to judge. They're quick to belittle, slow to forgive. We can go out there. We can do all the great things in the world. We can be A plus best at everything we do. We mess up one time. That's what people are going to remember us by. We can do great things. We can do exploits. We can be all that we can be. We can be all that we need to be for somebody. But you mess up one little time and see what happens. You're going to get a name. You're going to get a label. You're going to get people that only remember you for that bad thing. It's kind of like when we were in school, Brother Austin. Get your report card and bring it home. Mom and Dad see it. 
you got six A's and one F on that report card. It don't matter about them six A's, but you're going to get called out for that one F. Probably going to get your behind tore up if you were in my household. But it seems like that no matter what happened, I could have all the A's in the world, but that one little F on that report card is what stood out. It didn't matter. It didn't matter what the rest of it said. It didn't matter how good I did. It didn't matter if I got an A in lunch or if I got an A in recess. But if I got an F in math, that's all mom and daddy cared about. See, it was the negative that we focused on. It was, it was me being labeled a dummy in math class. That's what stood out in my life. Now, that didn't really happen, but... That's a story for another time. We see so many times in life, we read about people, we read about great heroes, we read about people that have done great things in life, but we also get to hear a lot about their failures. Some people, success isn't the only thing that they're known for. Some people have to fail and fail and fail and fail and fail, and finally, they'll have a breakthrough. Finally, something will click. Something will happen. They'll get their life turned around. Everything will get in order. And they'll get what they set out to achieve. See, there are some times in life we do great things, but we're just remembered for our last mistake. But I want to tell you all, we've done good around this place. We've done good around the Riverbend Pentecostals of welcoming people in. And I want to thank God for that, that we're growing, that we're maturing in the spirit, that we're able to welcome anybody and everybody in. It don't matter what your past looks like. It doesn't matter what mistakes you've made because we've all been there. Every single one of us, even this guy, even that guy, that guy, that guy. We all have things in our past that we are not proud of. And to God be the glory that he did not hold it against us. And to God be the glory that we don't hold it against one another. But we can come to a place that this is a safe place where we can come together and celebrate the victories that God is making through us. And we're going to be remembered for something great, church. We're going to be remembered, each and every one of us, for our successes rather than our failures in the kingdom of God. See, we're not like the world out there. Once you walk outside those doors, it's a whole different ballgame. But in here, in the church, in the kingdom of God, we have to be supportive of one another. We have to lift one another up. We have to be the church. We have to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ on this earth. And that's what we are called to be. And that's what we will be. And I believe that with my whole heart. But this morning, I want to preach about a man that most of us in here should know. This is a guy that did amazing feats in the kingdom of God. He was anointed. He was a king. He was a great leader. He was a great warrior for God. But even as mighty of a man that he was, he had a weak moment. He had a lapse of judgment. He had a time where he wasn't in the right mind. Even as mighty of a man as he was, he still slipped up and he had to be corrected. This was a man that could arguably be considered the most spiritual person you can read about in the Bible. He worshiped and talked to God daily. But even as close as he was to the Lord, this man, he still had trouble listening. He still messed up and he still had trouble with being corrected. But something happened one day when the Lord got down on his level. And he'll do that. He's going to get at you any way that he can. He will use anybody. He will do whatever he can to get a hold of you. To try to talk some sense into you. He sent somebody. He used somebody to speak a little bit of correction into this guy's life. And this is what I want to preach to you about this morning. He sent me a man. Amen. Now, for all the single ladies in here, this is not where this message is going. So you can just go ahead and get your mind off of that. But I just want to let you know that sometimes God is going to send somebody into your life to give you a little correction. He's going to send somebody into your life to let you know that you veered off track just a little bit. To try to get you back in line to where God had you. I just want to let you know that sometimes He may use the person that you never expected to help you whenever you fall off the wagon. I'm not talking about relationships or anything like that this morning, but I'm talking about how the Lord had one of his faithful followers fall out of step. He got out of line just a little bit. He fell off his wagon. He got out of kelter. He was off his path that the Lord laid before him. 
and he had to have somebody that could help get him back in line. Sometimes we got to have somebody that's going to speak a little truth to us. We got to have somebody that we can trust to tell us what we need to hear and not just what we want to hear. Sometimes he might just send somebody to help get your life back on track. Now, if you don't know who I was talking about, the story that we're going to come from, and the book of 2 Samuel, chapters 11 and 12, is where we're going to come from. And I, I didn't give Heidi any specific scriptures, or Sister Heidi, I'm sorry. But I just want to tell a story. And it's a story that's given to us to show how real life can be. You know, we see things, Brother Blake, that, you know, we, we could only imagine could be on TV. Things so far-fetched that they have to be made up in some writer's mind for entertainment purposes only. But no, there's real life in this Bible. Roughly 2,500 years ago, there was a story that was written down about a man's life, about a mistake that he made, about a time that he messed up, a weak moment that he had that could have defined his life, but it didn't. There was a time in his life where he was weak, and we can read about that in 2 Samuel chapter 11. David is the man that I'm talking about, the mighty man of God, the anointed one, the one that was the man after God's own heart. Starting out, it says, And it came to pass that after the year was expired, there was a time when kings would go forth to battle. I'm not going to follow this exactly as it's laid out in the scripture. But there was a time back in the day whenever two enemies would come face to face with one another that the king of the land would actually go out. He would be there to lead the charge. He would be the one that would go out there and he would lead his people as the great ruler and the great leader that he was. He would lead by example and go out with his troops onto the battlefield. He would be out there to work out a deal of surrender if they were to, to defeat. They would be out there as the forefront, the face of the war for their country. But you see, this time, David, he sent Joab. And David stayed home. So already, right here at the beginning of the story, we get like two verses in and David's already out of line. You see, this was a time whenever kings were supposed to go to battle, Brother Larry. Not just the general, not just the soldiers, but the great leader was supposed to go also. But it says David stayed home. Now, we don't know why. We don't know what it was. He could have been feeling bad. He could have had something wrong with him. We don't know. But the point is, he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He wasn't in line with, his, with the will that God had for him. And he stepped out of line. David stayed home. Now we read down just a little bit. David gets up from a nap. I mean like your Sunday naps. I know I do. I pretty much live for them on the weekends, but that's my last little bit of rest before the work week starts. But David, as mighty of a man as he was, he still got tired. David woke up in the afternoon and he went out and he was walking on the roof. He was out looking over his town, looking over his city, and he spotted somebody that caught his eye. David looked out, and there was this young lady that was out. From the way that, that I understand the houses were built, you had a house, and then you had a private courtyard in the back that couldn't be seen from any of the streets, so you had complete privacy in the back. But from David's point of view, he could see down into these people's backyard, and he saw this lady that was out there bathing herself. Now, David, if he would have been where he was supposed to be, if he would have been out on the battlefield, Brother Larry, he would have never had this bait put in front of him. He would have never had this temptation that was put in front of him. But because he wasn't where he was supposed to be, he was up on the roof looking out, and he saw something that caught his eye. And as he was out there, he didn't just look and say, Oh, man, I, I shouldn't have been looking at that. I, I could just imagine. He looked, and he looked, and he looked, until all of a sudden... He had done made a plan in his mind, I've got to have her. So that's what he did, Brother Larry. He went and he got some of his servants. He said, I want you to go to her house and I want you to figure out who she is. And whenever they got there, one of them said, isn't this the daughter of Eliam? The, ain't this Uriah's wife? Well, apparently that didn't matter because David sent them back and said, I want you to go get her and I want you 
bring her to me. And long story short, one thing leads to another, and there's a baby on the way. This kind of sounds like a modern-day soap opera. But you think about this. This lady's husband is out on the battlefield trying to fight for David. This lady's husband is out there trying to fight against the Ammonites, trying to win a war for Israel. And David stayed home while his men were out there. And then all of a sudden, this guy's wife ends up in the palace where she's not supposed to be. One thing leads to another. Sin happens. Sin creeps in. David took the bait that Satan put before him. And then all of a sudden, David's life is really messed up. You go on. David finds out that Bathsheba's pregnant. David, I'm sure, gets scared. He gets worried because he doesn't know what to do. He panics. And he, all of a sudden, he says, all right, I've got to get together with my guys. I've got to make a plan. I've got to figure this out. I've got to sort this out. I've got to, I've got to be sure that my tracks are covered. I've got to be sure that nobody finds out what I've done. This was a secret thing. Nobody has to know. So you know what? I'm going to send a messenger out to the battlefield. And I'm going to have Joab send Uriah back home. So David, whenever Uriah gets to the palace, Uriah comes in and David greets him. He doesn't want to be, you know, kind of blunt with, with what he's going to ask, with what he's trying to get accomplished here. But he starts asking him, he's like, how's the battle going? How, how's everything going out there? How's Joab doing? How's his leadership? How's the fight going? How, how's the casualties? How's everything going out on the battlefield? And then... He transitions into, well, you know what? You're, you're just such a great soldier, and I've got you here anyway. Why don't, why don't you just go spend the weekend with your wife? Why don't you go and have a meal? Take her out on a date. See, see what you can do. Yeah. Sounds like a good plan, but you know what? It didn't work. So Uriah is such a good soldier. He's such a, such a hardworking, honorable man. He said, no, I can't do that. He said, the ark and all of Israel and Judah and my commander Joab are out there on the battlefield. They're sleeping in tents and Joab and the soldiers are out in the fields and I'm here. There's no way that I can take advantage of what you're trying to get me to do. I can't go see my wife. I can't stay in my house whenever all my people are out there. He said, I can't do it. And you know what? He stayed in the soldiers' quarters at the gatehouse of the palace. David found out about it. He's mad. So he tries again. He sends for Uriah. He sends for him again, and David tries another trick of the enemy. He tries to get him drunk. This is the man of God. This is the Holy One of Israel. This is the anointed king that is messing up this bad. Look at how being out of line just one little bit has already transpired so much into this situation. It's just crazy what can happen because you're out of line just one time. But David sends for Uriah, and he tries to wine him and dine him and get him a little messed up. And he says, all right, now I want you to go, I want you to go spend the night with your wife again. He wasn't having it. Uriah, once again, slept in the soldier's quarters at the door of the palace. He just was not having it. He didn't want to have anything to do with it because he's such an honorable man. He only wanted to be pleasing to the Lord and to King David. He could, not, he could not separate himself from the soldiers. He could not get out of that mindset that I've got people out there, that I've got to be what I need to be for my country. He said, I, I can't take the weekend off. I can't do anything like this that you're wanting me to do. He said, I've got to be an honorable soldier. But Uriah, being the man that he was, he wouldn't do what David wanted him to do. So the next stage of the plan King David sent for Uriah and that morning before he came to the palace. He wrote a letter. In those days, the king's word was the law and there was no changing it. And David wrote a letter. King, or he wrote a letter to Joab, the general out on the battlefield. He said, this is what I want you to do. He said, Uriah won't cooperate with me. Uriah won't do what I've asked him to do. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take him whenever he gets back. And I want you to find the hottest battle that you can find. And I want you to put him out there. And as soon as the fighting starts, I want everybody to retreat. And I want you to leave him by himself so the enemy can take him out. 
Look at how much this has transpired. So David, David thinks he's in the clear. David thinks he's done what he needs to do. He thinks that, that he's got everything taken care of. He's, he's covered all of his bases. He's done everything that he needs to do to make sure that nobody's going to find out about this. From all appearances, it looks like he's won. It looks like he's going to get away with it. I could just imagine what was going on in David's mind. See, David knew the truth. He knew the commandments. He knew what was wrong. He knew what was right. He, he knew how to be pleasing to God. He knew what to do to live a good, wholesome, godly life in that day and age. He knew the commandments. He knew the law. And it seems like he broke just about every one of them because he was out of step that one time. One event led to another. One event led to another. A snowball effect happened. And then all of a sudden, now we're at the man is dead. So David, Bathsheba, we don't know really what time frame this happened. But she's carrying this baby. And then all of a sudden, David has a visitor show up at his doorstep. See, in that day, there was a man named Nathan. He was a prophet in the land. And Nathan came telling this story. He came to David and he had a, he had a message for him. He said, I got to tell you a story. He said, there was a rich man and there was a poor man in the land. He said, the rich man, he had an abundance. He had many herds of cattle. He had many herds of sheep. He had everything that he could ask for. And the poor man had one little lamb. He said that, that poor man, he loved that lamb. It was like a member of their family. It was, it was somebody that would eat from the, the table that the master sat at. That was a big deal. You didn't just let anybody eat at the master's table. But even this lamb was able to eat the scraps of food that come off of the table. They cared for this. That little lamb, it, it, the Bible says that it would crawl up in his chest and it would fall asleep. That, that was like a child to that family, to that man. It says there was a wayfaring man that came into town. And in those days, whenever you had a stranger roll in, it was customary that you would show them hospitality. You would invite them in. You would wash their feet. You would give them a meal, give them something to drink. And as this man was going through town, he came to the rich man. And the rich man would not take of his own flock. He would not take of his own herds. He went and he stole that little lamb from the poor man. That one little lamb, he went and stole it. And he prepared it for this wayfaring man that was coming through town. Nathan's sitting there explaining this story to David. And David, I, I, I kind of connect with him like this because every time I read that scripture, every time I read that passage, I get so mad because it, it's just like a, it's an anger that I can't explain comes over me whenever I read that there's somebody, a rich man, taken from a poor person like that. And that's the only thing that they had and they couldn't keep a hold of it. That's the only thing that they had. And there was somebody that came in and swiped it out from underneath them to try to feed somebody whenever they had an abundance. It, just, it, it irritates me so bad when I read that story. And David was the same way whenever he heard that. He, he told him, he said, this man shall surely be put to death. He said, and then the person that the lamb was stole from, I want them to have fourfold given back to them. He said, I want you to replenish them. I want him replenished. I want this man dead for what he did. And Nathan had to have the courage to look David in the eye and said, you're that man. Yeah. Yeah. He said, you're the man that stole from the poor man. Uriah had one wife. He had, he had Bathsheba. That's all he had. That was his family. And then you come in, the king. You can have anything that you want, anything you desire. You have all the money in the world. You have everything you could ever imagine and hope to have. And you stole from somebody that had as little as he did. David, taken back, Nathan is sitting there and he's telling him, the Lord's speaking through Nathan. And he says, he says, I've got to tell you, David, the Lord's speaking through him and he says, I've given you everything that you could ever imagine. I delivered you out of the hands of Saul. I gave you the palace. I gave you everything that you could ever imagine. And this is how you want to repay me, David. This is what you want to do to me. You have mistreated me. You've, you've taken what I've given you and just thrown it away. Everything that I've given you, you've just disregarded it for your own 
desires. David is in a weak place. David is in a place where where he's being called out. He's being corrected. He had somebody in his life that came and, and tried to get him back on track. I could just imagine everything that was going on in David's life up to this point. See, he knew the truth. He knew the commandments. He knew what was wrong and what was right. And I could just imagine the war that was going on in his mind and in his heart. And he's every day looking over his shoulder trying to figure out if somebody's coming after him, trying to figure out what's going on. If, I, if I've gotten away with it, is somebody going to figure me out? What are they going to label me whenever... They find out what I've done. David, he gets down into a place where he can't go any lower in this conversation. And he says, surely I have sinned against God. So there was a man that came into David's life that that understood what was going on because the Lord had spoke to him. The Lord had, had given him insight as to what was going on. And he had the courage to go to the king And to be able to point out how that he needed to be corrected. David, by all accounts, for everything that he committed should have been stoned to death. Everything that he did had the penalty of death. The Bible says that for the wages of sin is death. And we know that to be true. Just look at Adam and Eve. Look at everybody that's mentioned in the Bible. They could have been taken out at any given time. The Lord could have taken David out at any given time for any of these acts that he committed all the way up to this. But no, he gave him another chance. To God be the glory that sometimes we get second chances, Brother Tripp. To God be the glory that sometimes God makes a way for somebody to come into our lives and give us a little bit of correction to be able to speak a little bit of truth to us, to be able to make sure that we're going to be on the right track to get us back where we need to be. Sometimes he makes a way. He is the way maker. He's the one that can make a way out of no way. He, whenever we think that we're lost, whenever we think that we've come to the end, he can make a new way for us to get back in line. I got to thinking about this story. It seems like something that you would watch on TV, but it's something that truly played out in this man's life. I never really thought about the magnitude that this act had. But whenever you think about it in a spiritual sense, I got my answer from probably the most unlikely place that you could think of. Many years ago, there was a man named Leonard Cohen that wrote a song called Hallelujah. And there's others that have redone it, Jeff Buckley, Rufus Wainwright, and others. But for some reason, I was listening to this song about probably four months ago. And the Lord gave me this this message to go with it. There's some lyrics in that song. Think about whenever David invited Bathsheba to his house. The lyrics in this song said that she tied you to a kitchen chair. She broke your throne and she cut your hair. And from your lips she drew the hallelujah. And I got to thinking about that. You see, whenever he committed these acts, whenever he went through this, whenever he decided this is what I want, whenever she came over and the act was done, think about those lyrics Whenever he was in the middle of that sin, the part where it says she tied you to a kitchen chair, David got some some shackles and some chains put on him that he, on his own accord, could never take off. You see, there was something that came into his life whenever he was in the middle of that sin that had him bound down, that he can't break those chains on his own. Only God can take away something like that. And whenever you go on and you go through the song, it says she broke your throne. See, whenever that sin took place, she took his authority away from him. Every right that he had as the king was taken away because of that sin because just like any other man even though that he was the king he was supposed to be put to death if he would have been on trial if people would have known what was going on in his life he would have been a dead man when it says that she cut your hair she changed the way that he looked she changed she changed his appearance she changed his character she changed his name 
He changed his appearance. And from your lips you drew the hallelujah. That sin robbed him of his praise. That sin robbed him of his ability to praise God with a good conscience. It robbed him of his ability to be pleasing to God, to give him praise, to be the spiritual man that he was anymore. See, everything about David was different at this point. But the Lord sent him a man. The Lord sent him a man that was able to speak a little bit of truth into his life, Brother Tripp. The Lord sent him a man that was able to expound to him that he needed to be corrected. I'm not going to be much longer, so the praise team can come on up. See, David, David was the shepherd. David was the lion killer. He was the bear wrestler. He was the giant slayer. He was the anointed one of Israel. He was the man after God's own heart. But even somebody that had all of these great accolades, he had a weak moment, and he took the bait. And that night, that sin put shackles on him that he couldn't take off. And that robbed him of every authority that he had. It robbed him of his character and it changed his name. He went from being a great man of God to being a cheater, a liar, backstabber, fornicator, murderer. The worst things that we could ever think of as being a sin. David was now labeled as these things. That sin that he had in his life, that time that he messed up, the things he had in his past, had him labeled something that he couldn't get rid of. See, sometimes whenever we mess up, our sin can be so bad that people are going to look down on us. People are going to look at us like we're lesser people. People are going to look at us like that we have no authority to live anymore. We have no right to be somebody that can speak into somebody else's life. We have no right to be a respected human being anymore. <clears throat> if you would stand with me this morning. Your sin can do a lot of things in your life. It can give you a name that you can't take away. It can give you a name that you can't take away. But I want to tell you this morning that no matter what you've done, no matter what you've been through, even if you had a story like David's, even if you had a story that was worse than David's, it doesn't matter what it is because today you are still alive. You are here. You are in the presence of God. And I want to tell you this morning that God sent a man this morning to tell you that there is still time, that there is still breath in your lungs that you have to be able to make a voice, to be able to make a sound to heaven that says, God, I'm sorry. God, I want to be right. God, I want to be set back on the right path. God, I want to be back in your good graces. God, I don't want this name anymore. God, I don't want to be what these people call me. But I want to be heavenly. I want to be holy. I want to be a new creature. I want to be what you want me to be, Lord. I want to be what heaven wants me to be. I want to be in your will. I want to be what you want me to be, Lord. So I want to tell you that sin that you have in your life. It could change your name for a short time, but it don't have to change your identity. It can't change your character. It can't change who you are because only God can do that. Only God can give you a permanent name. And whenever that name is written down in that book of glory, whenever that name is written down in heaven, I want to tell you that that's what counts. It doesn't matter what somebody calls you here on earth. It doesn't matter what somebody calls you behind your back. It doesn't matter what somebody says about you because if you've repented, if you've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if you've had your sins washed away in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what anybody else calls you because that's all dead and gone. And God don't even remember it. God doesn't even remember your sins. But whenever you go through that process, whenever you come to God, whenever you make a decision that you want to change, the only name that matters is the one he gives you. The only one that matters is what the Lord tells you that you are. Sometimes in life, we get just a little bit out of balance. We get a weak moment. We get off track sometimes, get out of place. Sometimes it's not that big of a deal. Sometimes it's easy to come back in the line. But for some of us, we can spiral out of control just like David did. But it doesn't have to stay that way. I want to let you know this morning, there's a man standing right here behind this pulpit that's telling you that your life can change today. 
God sent you a man today to tell you that there is a greater life ahead of you. I know the story was long. I know it's full of details, but it, it's so true how it plays out that, that he went through so much. He did so many wrong things. But even after that, even as crazy and as bad as the things were that David committed, there was still a time to repent. There was still a chance to turn his life around. There was still a chance to make things right with God. There were still some consequences that David had to deal with. If you read on in the story, because of all the sin in his life, that, that baby eventually died shortly after being born. But David, after having somebody speak truth in his life, was able to look with inside of himself, turn his life around, and say, I know that I can't bring him back, but I can go to him. He said, I know I can't bring that little boy back. He said, but I know that I can live my life in such a way that I can go to him. I can make a difference in my life if I make a decision to turn around. I can make great things happen. I can get rid of my past. Those names that I've been labeled, those things that people have called me, those characteristics that I've taken on can all be changed today in this place you want to come see what I'm talking about, you come down here and have an experience with God. Come down here, step yes. out in faith, and see what God can do in your life. So come on, these altars are open.
only knew how far some of us have come. If you only knew some of the things that some of us have been forgiven of. God has the power to forgive anything. He has the power to take away anything in your past. But if you're on the fence, just dive on in. See what it's all about. See what He can do for you. See what God can do in your life. If you'll just give Him a chance. Christ. Why don't you pray with me this morning? Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray over Dorothy, and I pray that you order every step she takes from here forward. I pray against anything that may work against her mind. I pray that as she goes down in this water, that her past is left there forever. I pray that no more it can bug her. I pray that no longer her past has come against her. It can keep her from what you have for her. But I pray that this day forward, she can step in the promise you have for her. What you have been working on her for. What you have been calling her to. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. And I pray that she will win more souls. In the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that she will go out from this day forward right after this in the name of Jesus. Dorothy Woodring, upon the confession of your faith and the teaching of the apostles, 
I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins because you have already received in the, whole, the, the gift of the Holy Ghost and I now baptize you in the name of Jesus. Aren't you thankful that he's doing something? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm glad he's still up to something. Things are still happening. People are being changed. Amen. I'm so thankful. You may be seated. We want to go over the uh, announcements. Praise God. Brother Richard, thank you for the word this morning. So thankful that he sent me a man. Someone to tell me that I was doing right and that I was doing wrong. Praise God. Praise God. Just a reminder that the nursery is only for children ages six months through three years. Ladies prayer meeting tomorrow evening at 6.30. All the ladies are welcome. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. I watched, I, I watched her brother Blake pray for her this morning in the Holy Ghost. You could just see it yeah. start at the top of her head to the sole of her feet, Brother Sandy. You could just see it flow through her. I'm so thankful for that. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Ladies Bowling is going to be Friday, August the 12th at 6 o'clock p.m. in Sykeston. Bring money for concessions and bowling. Please let Sister Amanda know by August 7th. If you're going to go, so reservations can be made. Uh, church cleaning this week is team number five, Sister Casey and Sister Carly. Next Sunday, August the 7th, will be the next Secret Sister giveaway or drawing. It will be the next Secret Sister drawing. Next rally will be August the 21st at 4.54 p.m. at the First Church in Kennett. This rally is for everyone. And then men's conference is going to be September the 15th through the 17th. And it's going to be in Kansas City, Missouri. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries today? Oh, ah, yeah. Somebody, somebody realized. Praise God. Sister 
Sharon. All right, happy birthday. Birthday or anniversary? Birthday, all right. Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. These two ladies would stand. We are going to sing happy birthday to them. about what God's doing. Don't forget Wednesday night, Bible study, 7 o'clock. Pastor and them should be back home uh, next weekend, I believe. We miss them. Continue to pray that God's hand would be upon them and protect them and bring them back safely. Brother Blake, will you dismiss us in prayer, brother? Protect.